If you weren't here last week, uh, Amos is a prophet who was preaching to the divided kingdom. The northern kingdom was Israel, that became known as Israel. The southern kingdom was known as Judah. And this was taking place around 750 years before Christ. And it was a time of relative prosperity for the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Uh, their neighbors around them were continually in, fight, uh, in turmoil. They were fighting one another. Uh, there were times where there was villages along the outskirts of both uh, Israel and Judah that would get raided. It wasn't as though they were escaping this time completely unscathed. But in general, they were, it was a time of economic prosperity, also military might for both the kingdoms of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And yet within this time of prosperity and, uh, and relative strength, this prophet shows up. And he's actually from Judah, but he goes up into the court of the northern kingdom of Israel. He goes to the capital city of Israel, which was Samaria. And he begins to talk to the king. He begins to prophesy. And in that process, he reveals this idea of, the, of behind what makes a nation, which is made up of individuals, righteous. And today, we're going to be looking at the message of affliction. What is the message behind affliction? Now, have you ever had a time in your life when you feel like your plans or everything that you're wanting to have happen, or maybe even your, yourself physically, is being attacked and frustrated? Like you want to go this direction, you want to see this thing happen, and it feels like the doors are closing all the time. It feels like everything is going against you all the time, and it becomes frustrating for you. When I was in seminary, is years ago. I had a classmate that he and I got along quite well. He was a friend of mine. However, he was a little bit of a schemer. What I mean by that, he was always looking for a way to get an edge. He was looking for a way to either get an edge financially or an advantage, you know, that would put him ahead. And it's just the way he was. And he did many things that were, that were these little things he would do. And they always were right along the edge of integrity. And sometimes you might say maybe even cross that edge. And for example, one day he got this idea in his head that if he bought cars that had been damaged by water to the point that they were considered by the insurance companies a complete loss, a total loss. So the, the term we use in, in America for that, the car is totaled. It means that the insurance company has said this is beyond recovery. He got this idea in his head that if he could buy these cars, get the engines running, clean them up, then he could resell them because their total, the, the, the price was very low. So he figured if I can get them going again, I can sell them for a profit. And the reason why he wanted water damage is because he felt like, well, the body itself hasn't been broken. It hasn't been twisted. There's not a lot of uh, external damage. It's just this internal stuff. Now, I think most of you sitting here today, there's probably something in your head that's going, eh, something about this idea doesn't seem quite right. And the problem is, why, one reason why it's not right, and I don't know all the details, because I just told him I don't think this is a very good idea. But when the insurance companies say this thing is totaled out, it's very difficult to get that car reinsured, because the company has paid the price for this car being damaged, and then for it to go back on the road, the companies don't like that. But I don't know all the ins and outs. I still don't know it today. I just told him, I don't think that sounds legal. And he says, oh, it's legal. And so he did this. He, he bought a car that had been damaged by water. We lived at the time in the San Francisco Bay area. Uh, there's a, it's actually kind of a mountainous area around the bay. So it was susceptible to sudden rains and flash floods and damaged water damaged cars. Sometimes people just got drunk and drove into the bay or they went out on the beach and got stuck and then the tide came in. There was several opportunities to buy water damaged car in the bay area. So he bought one. And he went through this process and got it fixed up and cleaned out the inside. It always smelled a little funky, but, you know, whatever. You put enough uh, air fresheners in there. And as seminary students at the time, we didn't have very much money. So he put pretty much all their, all their free money into buying this car that he was then looking for a buyer. And he couldn't find a buyer. You know, he would tell folks it was water damaged and people just ran away. They didn't want a car that had been water damaged. You don't know what, what other parts may have been damaged by that. 
Finally, and every day that he, you know, this car didn't sell, he was losing money. And every week, days passed into weeks, and he was stressing out about it. Finally, his dad stepped in. His dad bought the car from him. It was kind of this act of mercy, right? And, and uh, all the, all the, uh, the guys you know, were kind of watching what he was doing here were like, Phew, his dad got him off the hook. But instead of realizing this was a bad idea, he saw this as a smashing success. Because he had, you know, his plan had worked out. He had bought this car at a low price. He had fixed it up. He managed to sell it. The fact that it was his dad that bailed him out didn't seem to register with him. So he did it again. He bought another car and went through the whole process again. And we were, his friends, we were all standing around and saying, dude, this is a terrible idea. What are you doing? Because we knew that this was, there's something not right about this. And the second time, he didn't tell people it had been water damaged. Because he was like, well, this is, this is the reason why I wasn't bought. It's really no big deal. It's, it's just as good as the first one. So I don't need to tell them it was water damaged. And one day I was going to class in the morning. I was walking out in our, in our uh, parking lot where, we, where the married students lived. It was surrounded by trees. And I saw a tree had fallen right down the middle of his car. And, uh, and this, is, this isn't that car, but it was like this. It was like the finger of judgment just right down the middle of the car. So I went to his apartment, knocked on the door, and got him. And he and his wife came out, and she was never on board with this idea in the first place. And she just looked at it and walked away because he had never insured the car. He was planning on just selling it, didn't want to spend any more money buying insurance. So this thing was completely uninsured. And it was looking like that. And he went through several days of feeling kind of picked on by God. Afflicted by God. Now, affliction is different than just having some bad thing happen to you during the day. Affliction is this feeling that there are forces, and in this case, spiritual forces, that are deliberately going out of their way to bring pain into your life. Affliction, it's this idea that there are forces that seem to be deliberately going out of their way to bring pain into your life. For example, the book of Job is a, is a very good example of a person being deliberately afflicted. In this case, he's being afflicted by Satan, but with the permission of God in order to test his righteousness. It's not that Job just had a series of bad days where bad things happen in a fallen world. It was a very deliberate attack upon him. And upon his life. And in fact, one reason why the book of Job is even in the Bible is because most people, and most of the times you see this in the Bible, and in fact, if you've read the book of Job, Job's friends talk to him about this. Most times in the Bible, affliction is brought about by God in order to be a way to bring you back out of a place of unrighteousness into righteousness. It's a painful way of correction. And if you read the book of Job, this is what his friends are always telling him. One reason why Job is in there is because it gives us one of the very few different perspectives of affliction, which was this was a test of Job's righteousness. It wasn't happening to him because he had sinned. But most of the time in the Bible, affliction is a correction to sinful behavior. And in this case of this friend of ours in, in seminary, and I think most of you hear, hearing the story, there's a part of you that even before this all happened, you immediately know this is coming from God because this guy is studying to be a pastor for one thing. And he's walking in this place of an integrity, which is very wobbly, you know, and I, I don't know all the legal stuff around buying a car that's been totaled and then selling it. But I know if you don't tell people full disclosure what they're buying, this is wrong. It's just morally wrong if it's not legally wrong. And I think it's legally wrong. But this friend of ours, and, and it wasn't just me that saw this, and I liked the guy. I mean, so we would talk about this all the time, and I'd just be like, duh. But there'd be all these other, there was other guys around him too, trying to talk to him, but he didn't want to hear this. He didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to hear that God was trying to teach him a lesson, because if he had to acknowledge that God was trying to teach him a lesson, then he would have to acknowledge that he was behaving in a way that required God to intervene in this painful way. He would have to acknowledge that he had been in a place of a lack of integrity, a place of sin, and he didn't want to do that. He just didn't want to do that. He was very resistant 
that he had gone so far outside the lines that God would actually use the stick to slap him back into, into place. And when the prophet Amos was speaking to the kingdoms of both Israel and Judah about their sinful dealings, both of those kingdoms also refused to listen to what the prophet had to say. They looked around the world and they said, but, but we're in a place of military might. They looked around their neighbors and said, but we're in a place of relative economic prosperity. And when Amos was telling them, no, you are out of step with God, they didn't want to hear it. Amos chapter 3 starts this way. He's speaking to the king of Israel. He says, hear this word, the Lord. Whenever you see the Lord in all capitals in a lot of your English translations, that's when the, the Bible actually uses the proper name of God, which we think is Yahweh. But we're not really exactly 100% sure that's how that should be pronounced. Because in Hebrew, they deliberately misspelled it so that you wouldn't say the name of the Lord uh, in a flippant manner. Kind of interesting. This is, hear the word the Lord has spoken to you, O people of Israel. Against the whole family I brought up, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. One of the problems that both the kingdoms of Israel and Judah had, because they used to be one united kingdom, in believing that God would ever do anything to discipline them in a harsh manner, it's like, hey, we're the chosen people of God. We're the chosen people. God's never going to do anything that would make our lives uncomfortable. He's going to go against all of our enemies, but he's never going to do anything to me because I'm chosen. Christians can have the same attitude. Jesus died for me. God loves me. He's never going to do anything to harm me or to bring me in out of back, use the stick to bring me back into line because we're chosen. And the response that Amos has is, is it's precisely because you are chosen that the stick is being applied. You are special and you are supposed to stand out as a special people for me and you're not. Your lack of integrity and the way you're treating people around you is no different from these nations that have rejected me. And so you're going to be brought back into discipline. And he says, do two walk together unless they've agreed to do so? In other words, we agreed on a covenant. We agreed on a promise, people of Israel. And you are going against that promise. And then he asks a series of questions. And the point of the questions are things don't happen by accident. He says, does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? Now, for us, because we're not really used to how lions work, most of us, what he's saying there is like, the lion roars for a reason. And the reason is he has prey, and he doesn't want anyone to come near it. So the lion roars for a reason. Things happen for a reason. Does he growl in his den when he's caught nothing? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when no snare has been set? In other words, you know, does a bird get trapped unless someone has set up a trap for it? Things happen for a reason. Does a trap spring up from the earth when there's nothing to catch? When a trumpet sounds in the city, do not the people tremble when disaster comes to the city? Has not the Lord caused it? Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants or to his prophets. So he's saying to them, listen, we had a special covenant between us. And you have violated this covenant. You have chased after other gods. You do not find the things that I find important, important. You are oppressing the poor. You are refusing justice to people. And we agreed to be in this relationship together. And yet you, O Israel and Judah, have seemed to think, well, I'm going to just go a different direction now. And God says, well, I'm not going a different direction. We agreed to walk together. And you may decide the agreement's over, but I haven't. But unfortunately for Amos, the king of Israel was kind of like my friend in seminary. He had a hard time seeing that his actions were being addressed by God in a painful manner. He just saw it as, well, bad things sometimes happen. And in spite of all the afflictions that were brought upon the nation of Israel, in order to get them to change their ways... We know ultimately that the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, ignored the warnings, not just of Amos, but of many prophets. And they were eventually conquered by the Assyrians. 
And with this example before them, you'd think the kingdom of Judah would kind of wake up. And they did for a little while and get back on line with God. But then they too went off the rails. And 150 years after Israel was conquered, Judah was conquered by Babylon. And most of you know this story. They were taken into exile. And this begins the 70 years of exile. The destruction of the temple of Solomon. All these things took place. But before all this happened, God was trying to get the attention of Israel. And Amos points out to Israel, these bad things that have been happening to you have been happening for a reason. But they don't want to hear it. And Amos, if you remember from last week, Amos comes from a, an agricultural background. He was a rancher. He wasn't just a little sheep herder. He had flocks. And so he uses these imagery of the way the kingdom of Israel is acting as a kind of bovine stupidity. They're acting like a dumb cow. He says this, hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. Again, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. Amos is one of the few that brings both women and men to accountability for their actions. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will each go straight out through the breaks in the wall. So this wall that surrounds your city you think is going to keep you safe, it's going to break and you're going to be taken out through the breaks of the wall. And you will be cast out towards Harmon, declares the Lord. Go to Bethel and sin. The places that the northern kingdom went to worship were Bethel and Gilgal. There were these two areas because they didn't go to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. So they had these different places they worshipped. If you remember the story, when Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman, she brings this fact up. She says to him, well, you Jews tell us we have to worship in Jerusalem, but we worship on this mountain. So he says, go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin and get more. In other words, go to your places of worship and just keep on sinning. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites. This is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and a lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So this is the painful stuff he brought. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. And yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens and your vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and all its trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you, as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. He who formed the mountains, creates the wind, reveals the thoughts of man. He who turns down dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. We can learn some national as well as personal lessons from this passage of affliction and responding to affliction. And I've told you already, affliction is an interesting thing in the scriptures, kind of nuanced. There is no one monolithic reason behind affliction. Sometimes affliction takes place as a part of a refining process in preparing a people to be more pure, like this example out of Malachi, which is after the exile, by the way, in Babylon, the people returned back to uh, Jerusalem, and he's trying to get the, the people to be prepared to serve him again. He says of the of the Levites, who were the priestly class, he, God, will sit as a refiner and purer of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who bring offerings in righteousness. 
and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So sometimes affliction is used to bring about a purification of your soul. And from the Western point of view, we don't like this idea anymore, by the way. Uh, very much the Western point of view is like, well, God should always just be like treating us as though we're kindergartners, always patting us on the head and telling us we're nice and good. But if we want to be in a mature relationship with God, this is the times it's good to think of him as father. And when you go against a good father, he's going to do what it takes to bring you back in the line because he cares. Now, it's true also Satan sometimes uses affliction to discourage the faithful. You know, Job is an example of this. He is one of the few examples, but an entire story is devoted to him because it is, an, it is a time. Affliction can sometimes be a spiritual attack. But in the case of Amos, and really of all the prophets that warned of coming affliction or pointed to afflictions that had already taken place, the vast majority of the time is that affliction is God's wake-up call. It's his wake-up call to nations. It's his wake-up call to individuals. Just yesterday at the uh, men's breakfast, we were talking about the story of Jonah. Jonah is a good example of a person who is in conflict with God, and he is afflicted by God. Jonah has painful, bad things happen to him to drive him back into the place of obedience. You know the story? Jonah is told, go preach to the people in Nineveh. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh because Jonah hates the people of Nineveh. He doesn't want them to receive the forgiveness of God. So he figures if I never preach the message of repentance, they'll never get a chance to repent. And so he runs away from God and God afflicts him with a storm in the boat. And then he afflicts him kind of in a humiliating but somewhat humorous fashion by getting swallowed by a fish, whole, taken over to the shore, barfed back up onto the ocean, I mean barfed back up onto the beach, where Jonah then has to walk to Nineveh, and you can imagine being in the belly of a fish for three weeks. That guy didn't smell very good, probably didn't look very good, and he goes and preaches to Nineveh. He is afflicted by God very deliberately in order to bring him back into a place of obedience. And while I think it's good, you know, if you're feeling that your life is being afflicted, and if this is happening to you and you're a believer, there's usually a spiritual, there's the sense of the Holy Spirit. There's usually something within you that says, you need to pay attention to this. But we don't often like to. But it's not like we're a bunch of innocent lambs you know, walking all wide-eyed like, gee whiz, I wonder why this is happening. Usually there's, some, there's an inkling within us that knows what's going on. But we don't want to admit it. And if we're in the place that we don't want to admit it, usually, if you're in a Christian community, if you have some friends that will speak close to you, they may say something to you like, you know, I think the way this idea of you selling these cars is God's way, you know, all this stuff happening is God's way of saying, you shouldn't be doing this, which is what our, my friend heard. And there was a part of them that kind of knew that. But his, his perceived need to make some money because he was, they didn't have any money while they're going to seminary, outweighed all other things, including wanting to look honestly about how he was dealing with God. And I think that we often too readily assume our innocence when we face affliction. I know for my life, my first inclination when I face any kind of thing that feels like it's an affliction or a difficulty is to say, well, life is hard in a fallen world and bad things happen. But affliction is different than that. It's different than just bad things happening. There's a deliberate quality to it. Things aren't going. There's no, sometimes it feels like there's no real logical sense that things are going the way they're going. Why? There's a deliberate quality to it. For example, Jesus was afflicted by God because of our sin. He didn't end up on the cross by accident. He was deliberately placed there. And the scripture says so. This is out of Isaiah. This is, a, this is a prophecy written about the Messiah that's about 600 years before Christ. Actually, it's about 650 years before Christ. It says this, Surely he, they're talking about the Messiah who's to come. Surely he took up our infirmaries and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. 
Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. See, there's a deliberate quality. The Lord laid upon Christ the iniquity, the lack of integrity, the sin of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Now, some of you may say, well, it seems cruel of God that he would deliberately bring about affliction. But again, when you read the scriptures, you find out that God brings affliction in order to save people from their sin. He does it in the Old Testament to try and guide the nations of Israel, guide the kingdom of Judah away from self-destructive policies. He deliberately lays this affliction upon Christ so that he becomes our sacrifice. God does this in order to save people from their sin. But as human beings, again, we don't very often want to look at the issues of our lives. And so this can become a painful process. And the more that we refuse to listen to it, the more that he feels like he has to, the more God will turn up the volume to, for us to hear it, what's going on. For Israel, for example, they felt pretty good about themselves. They felt proud about the sacrifices they were bringing. They felt good about their levels of devotion. You know, Amos says, the Lord says through Amos, boast about them, you Israelites. This is what you love to do. But in the midst of their devotion, they weren't listening to the heart of God. And it's easy for us to do this. This is when our relationship becomes a religion. When, when, we, when, a, when our relationship with God becomes less about knowing him and more about just the religious aspect of things, then we can become a people that bring their tithes and offerings, that do all the outward things around our faith, but not hear the heart of God. And Christians can fall into this. So the people of Israel, they weren't listening to hear his desire to have idols removed from their lives. He wasn't, they weren't listening to his concern for the poor and the mistreatment that the poor were receiving from the hands of the devout. They weren't listening to how disgusting he, that he regarded some of the rituals around their worship, which included ritual prostitution. They weren't listening because they didn't want to. And this becomes our challenge because sometimes we're not all that different. You know, I've found most of the time when a Christian and a Christian is someone I'm defining as a person who in their life have made a conscious choice to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When a Christian is undergoing affliction, it's usually because there's some point of disobedience in their life. And we don't like to hear that. We like to think we're Job. That we're super righteous and God is just testing us. But Job is the exception, not the rule. Again, the story of Job is in the Bible because he is an extraordinary exception. But very often, there's some point of disobedience in our life. Maybe it's a lifestyle choice. Maybe it's an attitude. For Jonah, for example, the reason he was afflicted is he had an attitude of hate toward these Ninevites. He would rather see them burn under the judgment of God than to try and tell them that they need to repent of the way they were acting. Sometimes what's going on is hidden. It's even hidden from us. We need to have people speak into our lives or we need to be in a place of prayer to allow God to reveal it to us. And if we're not willing to be honest with ourselves as individuals or as a church, entire churches can go down this road where they're in a place of lack of integrity. They're outside the heartbeat of God. You know, there's churches, for example, that are very racist. Uh, they'll, they'll focus on it. Like the, national, the Christian nationalistic churches, they're very racist. And yet they raise their hands and praise to God. And we know that God doesn't find this to be something that brings him glory. It can happen to entire communities. It can happen to entire countries. Where we get very self-righteous about our relationship with God, even though our heart and God's heart are not in connection. And when that happens, God has no choice. He will try different ways to bring us to realization. He'll bring people into our lives to try and speak into our lives. My friend had several guys around him. I wasn't the only one. Just like most of you, it wasn't like a, a, a difficult concept to say, this is a bad idea what this guy was doing. And he had lots of people around him that were trying to speak into his life gently, saying, listen, man, I don't want to pass judgment, but this is not a good idea. 
This is going to lead to more harm than good. But he didn't want to hear it. And so God had to turn up the volume until finally one day he brought a tree right down the middle of the car. And it was the only car in the entire parking lot that a tree fell right down the middle of it. And it was pretty hard to look at that and go, boy, that's a coincidence. And for Christians, we're a bit like the nation of Israel. We have made a conscious choice to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. We made a conscious choice to do this. We emphasize that conscious choice in our particular tradition by baptizing people who are believers. It's a symbol of this conscious choice to follow Christ. And you might come to some place in your life where you're like, I don't really want to be close to following Christ right now. I'd like to have a little distance between this choice I made with Jesus as my Lord. Not just my buddy or my friend, but my Lord. And if you've made that conscious choice and you've decided on your own, I'm going to walk away from that conscious choice. God doesn't walk away from it. He died for that. He shed his blood for you. And he's not going to just say, well, it doesn't really matter that much to me. God takes your commitment to him seriously. And even when you go through times that you don't seem to be taking it seriously, he always will take it seriously. So if you're ever in a place of affliction, the first thing you need to do is ask the Lord in prayer. Are there areas of disobedience in my life? Is there an action or an attitude or something going on, Lord, that you are having to bring affliction into my life so that I wake up? And then just be silent before the Lord and see what he brings up. He might show you some way you treat your spouse or your children. He might show us how you approach your relationship with the church or other believers. He might show that it's some kind of lifestyle thing you've gotten involved in, which always starts small, but then can begin to escalate. He might show you that you just really don't care that much anymore about walking in the path the Lord has set for you. And when he shows you things like these, don't try and justify it. Don't argue with God. It's a waste of time. You repent of it. Repent just means you turn around 180 degrees. You go the other direction. You don't have this thing involved in your life anymore. And then your feet will be back on the place of life. Refined, hopefully renewed, as you walk with Christ. Now, I know this is kind of a hard message, but it's a message that's from the scripture. And any of you who are parents, you know that sometimes positive reinforcement doesn't always work. Sometimes you need to bring in a little pain into a child's life for them to wake up. And if you're a child of God and you're not listening to the gentle instruction of the father, that gentle instruction will start to become a little bit more Hard to avoid. But never interpret this as God hating you. The scripture tells us time and again, God disciplines those whom he loves because he cares about the direction your life is going. And if you see a brother or sister that is making a serious attitude mistake or action mistake, just like we saw this guy making, say something to him. Don't just sit there and watch them walk off a cliff. Now, they may choose to walk off the cliff anyway. But love says, speak into their life. You don't have to be all judgy about it. You can just say, I don't think this is a good idea. And I think the way you're acting is going to bring pain into your life. And if they ignore you and pain comes into their life, you don't have to go, see, ha, ha, told you so. Your role is then to say, listen, are you hearing? Are you seeing what's happening? This is part of bearing one another's burdens. 
Sometimes the burden we bear for one another is that blind spot of sin. So we come up alongside our brother and sister and say, let me carry this with you. Because you don't seem to be seeing it. And you need to see it so that you can get out of this. It's, a, it's an action of love. But it's not something we need to run in and, and, uh, and look for. I mean, if you stay in the place of, of righteousness before God, there's no need to afflict. So be aware of your life. Because if you're a believer, you are in a relationship with the living God. You're not in a relationship with a philosophy. You're not in a relationship with a book. You're in a relationship with the living God. And the living God is aware of who you are, what you are. So much so he was willing to die for you so you could have life. And he takes that seriously. So take it seriously, you too. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. And Lord, this is a hard, it's kind of hard uh, to hear sometimes. You know, we always think about, you know, you being a God of love. And we tend to equate love with just everything soft and wonderful. We, uh, we don't like the idea of discipline being part of love. And yet I think any of us, really, if we can stand back from it and look at how you have worked in our lives, how we have, as parents, have had to discipline our children whom we love, would die for. We realize this isn't so far outside of, of just the character of who you are. So may we be aware of the message of affliction in our lives, maybe in the lives of people around us. May we be aware so that we can help people come into a place of thinking carefully about who they are. And if it's a, if it's a place that brings about uh, repentance and renewal, then praise the Lord. And we pray that that would be the case in times of affliction. Give us the courage to look at who we are in your eyes. We know that we're loved by you. We know that you sacrificed for us. But there are times, Lord, when the truth is that we are outside of your heart's will. We are outside of what you desire. And Lord, when we are in those places, it's a fearful thing to pray. But we pray that you'll do what it takes to bring us back into your good graces. For our own sake and for the sake of glorifying you in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.